Hello, and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver, and I'm a scientist, and back there is Cindy Oliver, and she's a dog. In this video, we are going to be talking about pee hacking and how it can be used to fool people into thinking a significant effect has occurred when it really hasn't. Twitter has been going a bit mad in the last few days with people claiming a new paper shows that taking a vaccine leaves you worse off than not being vaccinated at all. Let's have a look at a few of those tweets. This one is from Dr. Jordan Peterson, who is a self-professed best-selling author and clinical psychologist with our number one education podcast. And this is what he says. OMFG, this is not good. This is not good at all. Serious adverse events of special interest following mRNA vaccination in randomized trials. And then he provides a link to the preprint paper. And here's one from someone who calls himself freedom loving mama. Or as you say, mama, not sure. Anyway, surely this can't be ignored. The excess risk of serious adverse events of special interest surpass the risk reduction for COVID-19 hospitalisation relative to the placebo group in both Pfizer and Moderna trials. And this is essentially the main claim that is being made in the paper and what is getting the anti-vaxxers so excited. And unsurprisingly, a number of anti-vaxxers have taken this further and made claims that even the paper doesn't say, like this one. A new paper by BMJ editor Dr. Peter Doshi has analysed data from Pfizer and Moderna COVID vaccine trials and found that the vaccines are more likely to put you in hospital than keep you out. And here's one more from a guy who calls himself the expert. pro vaxxers check this out and then send me the predictable response. It's not even peer-reviewed, bro. Serious adverse events of special interest following mRNA vaccination in randomised trials shows that risk increase surpasses risk reduction. Now, the fact that this paper isn't peer-reviewed is actually the least of its problems. It's basically just a rubbish paper that uses a technique known as p-hacking, followed by some apples to oranges comparisons. So what is p-hacking? This paper here, which was published in PLOS Biology, explains what p-hacking is. Essentially, p-hacking occurs when researchers collect or select data or statistical analyses until non-significant results become significant. In other words, if their original analysis doesn't show any statistically significant difference between the data, they keep analysing different subsets until they find something that is significant. And if you do this enough times, you will always find some significant difference by chance. So how has p-hacking been used in the paper that is being tweeted? Let's have a look at the paper. So this is the paper here. And at the time I took this screenshot, it had been downloaded 43,641 times. And there were 293,544 abstract views, which is quite a lot. Now, to be fair to the authors, they are quite open in what they've done in this paper. The problem is what they've done makes no sense and is not a valid way to assess adverse events. So what did they do? They went to already published data on both the Pfizer and the Moderna trials. So the data they have used is essentially nothing that wasn't already in the public domain. However, they have done a rather strange new analysis. Instead of looking at all adverse events, they have come up with a list of what they call serious adverse events of special interest and just looked at these events and ignored the rest. So what did they include and what didn't they include? Let's have a look. 
Okay, this is a list of adverse events that they did include. And if you'd like to read them all, you can stop the video now or alternatively, I will provide a link to the paper in the video's description so you can look at them at your leisure. This is the first page of the list of adverse events that they didn't include. And this is the second page of adverse events they didn't include. So they excluded a lot more adverse events than what they included. Now, it makes sense why they didn't include some of the adverse events that were in the second list, because it does include things like gunshot wounds and car accidents. However, that's not the majority of them. And there are quite a lot of anomalies between what is included and what isn't included. For instance, they included diarrhea, but they didn't include vomiting. They included arthritis, but they didn't include osteoarthritis, even though osteoarthritis is a form of arthritis. They included psychotic disorders, but didn't include bipolar disorder or just plain mental disorders. They included hyperglycemia, but not hypoglycemia. They included gastrointestinal hemorrhage, but not duodenal ulcer hemorrhage, even though duodenal ulcer hemorrhage would be included as a gastrointestinal hemorrhage. They included coronary artery disease, but didn't include arteriosclerosis, even though both of these are diseases of the arteries that tend to take years to develop. And I could go on, but I think you get the idea. But even with all this cherry picking of adverse events, they still weren't able to find a significant difference between people who got the vaccine and people who got the placebo. So they had to use a another trick. So what they did was, instead of comparing the number of people in each group who had an adverse event, they instead looked at the total number of adverse events they had. For instance, if someone had diarrhea and abdominal pain, which often go hand in hand, that person would have been counted twice. And finally, when they did all this, they managed to find a statistically significant difference in what they call serious adverse events of special interest between those who were vaccinated and those who weren't. Although they could only reach statistical significance if they combined the data from Pfizer and Moderna. If they looked at either one of them by themselves, the difference was not significant. And the difference they found was an extra. 12.5 adverse events per 10,000 participants amongst those who were vaccinated. So their p-hacking and double counting of people who had adverse events had finally got them a statistically significant result. But now they needed to make it seem like it was a really big deal. So what they did was they compared the number of adverse events with the number of people who were hospitalised with COVID in the placebo group in the trials and then made the observation that there were more excess serious adverse events of special interest than people hospitalised with COVID. Now, this comparison is disingenuous for a number of reasons. Firstly, as I previously mentioned, if a person suffered more than one adverse event, they were double counted. But a person who was hospitalised for COVID was only counted once. Secondly, a large number of the adverse events that they classified as serious adverse events of special interest are not things that are serious enough to land you in hospital. For instance, generally, if you get diarrhoea, you stay home near the toilet. You don't go to hospital. Likewise, if you suffer a rash, which was also on the list, you don't go to hospital. And there are many, many other conditions which they have classified as serious adverse events of special interest that would not require hospitalisation. So they are comparing apples with oranges. And I didn't actually have any apples and oranges. So just imagine that this green tennis ball is a Granny Smith apple and this Orange ball is an orange. 
Finally, whereas everyone in the vaccine group was exposed to the vaccine at the time the trials were completed, the vast majority of people in the placebo group had not been exposed to COVID as it was not a challenge trial. They relied on some people being naturally exposed as they went about their day-to-day activities. But as there were many restrictions in place at the time, most people in the trial weren't exposed to COVID. So the authors of the preprint are comparing adverse events from a large group of people with hospitalisation figures from a small group of people. Again, apples and oranges. Very big apples and very small oranges. And of course, being hospitalised is not the most serious thing that can happen if you get COVID. A significant proportion of people die. This modelling study was recently published in the Lancet Infectious Diseases, and they estimated based on official reported COVID-19 deaths that 14.4 million deaths were prevented by vaccination over a one-year period. And if they use excess deaths, Instead of reported deaths in their calculation, the estimated number of lives saved was 19.8 million. In summary, the preprint being touted by anti-vaxxers uses p-hacking to show statistically significant differences where they don't really occur and then uses an apples to oranges comparison to make it meaningful when it isn't. If you'd like to look further into the data that I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember, this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. Thank you for listening. If you found this video useful, please hit the like button so that YouTube will share it with more people. And if you'd like to see more videos about the science in the future, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.